In this video, we're going to discuss some examples of government failures. The first example to talk about is from the U.S., and it concerns water for agriculture in the western part of the United States. Now, water for agriculture in the eastern part of the United States is not really a problem. The eastern part of the United States is much less arid than the west, and so farmers can usually just depend on natural rainfall in order to grow crops. But in the West, as those of us who've lived there for a while in Utah know, that's not the case. Particularly in, in areas of the West like in Utah where most of the precipitation falls in the has in the past at least fallen in the form of snow, which occurs during the wintertime when crops don't grow. The federal government has been subsidizing water projects in the West for a very long time. Maybe I should change a tense of that. The federal government used to subsidize water projects in the West. Starting around perhaps 1990, it became much more reluctant to do that. But from the earliest part of the uh, 20th century uh, up to around 1990, the federal government was quite enthusiastic about subsidizing water projects by in, in the West, uh, building dams like the, um, the the dam that holds Lake Powell or the dam that holds Lake, Lake Mead as examples. And by subsidizing, what I mean is that the federal government has paid for these projects and has often required the states involved to compensate the federal government, but on very generous terms, like you get a, a loan that lasts 50 years or even more at a well below market interest rate. The, some of these projects have gone certainly for urban areas, but the greatest beneficiaries have been agriculture. And the reason is that agriculture is by far the biggest user of water in the West. In Utah, for example, agriculture uses approximately 80% of the water that's diverted from natural sources. A and by, by the way, that, that agriculture, some of it is for food for people, but a lot of it is food for animals. For example, in Utah, I have done some calculations because these figures aren't readily available, and more than 50% of the, U the water that's used in Utah is used to grow hay which of course is a food for animals. Uh, s some of it is actually about, I think about uh, maybe more than 10% of Utah's alfalfa production is actually exported to China every year. So there's a sense in which Utah exports Colorado River water to China because the Colorado River, which is a river in the eastern and southern part of the state, is a source of water for a large part of that agriculture. Uh, almost all the agriculture in those in those parts of the state. So I wanted to give an example here. California is also an arid western state. I was living in California in the early 1990s when there was a drought. Urban dwellers were conserving water very, very, with, with a lot of effort. For example, most people when they took a shower that put a bucket in the shower to capture some of the water that came out so that it wouldn't go down the drain, and then they use that water, for example, to flush the toilet. And the reason is because urban dwellers were facing very high price for water, and lots of government pressure and social pressure to conserve water. At the same time that urban dwellers were doing this, farmers in California were still, still growing rice. Rice is an extremely water-intensive crop. At some Portion, during some portions of the growing season, the fields literally have to be flooded. Uh, California is a huge producer of rice. And that means that farmers at that time in California were really not conserving water at all. Now, this is changing. In the most recent drought in California, in, let's see, I guess that was probably 2019. I might have gotten the year wrong. Farmers in California were, some of them at least, were required to reduce the amount of water that they used 
in order to divert some of that water to urban areas. So things are changing in the West. Things are changing rather slowly. In Utah, the situation is pretty similar to the situation in California. Utah urban dwellers pay uh, I was going to say a high price for water. It's not necessarily high in terms of what it, in terms of the free market price, because in Utah has a very unique system where half of the budget for water districts is uh, derived from property taxes. So actually, Utah urban water prices are quite a bit lower than they ought to be, if they were showing were reflecting the true cost of water delivery. Now, when you have low water prices, of course, l lower than in the neighboring states because neighboring states don't use the property tax to, to fund water districts, low prices give people an incentive to use more than high prices. But the biggest distinction, so, so, so Utah urban water prices are too low. But compared to agricultural water prices, they're much too high because Utah farmers in general actually don't pay for water. That is, they don't pay for quote unquote liquid water. They don't pay per gallon. If you were to buy a farm, you would have to pay more money to purchase the water rights to the farm. Without the water rights, the farm might be useless. And so farmers pay an upfront cost when they acquire the land for the water right. Um, that's a legal right. That's sometimes not called wet water. It's just the legal right to water. But the marginal cost of water to farmers in Utah is in general zero. This, of course, means there's absolutely no incentive for farmers to conserve water. To the extent that I was listening to a presentation by the president of a company that makes irrigation products, both for residences and for agriculture, who said that he was once having a discussion with a farmer and asked, uh, asked him how he ran his pivot irrigation system. So uh, pivot irrigation is a really common way of irrigating farms in the western part of the US if you're flying over the western part of the US, you often see uh, this this kind of pattern of green agricultural areas. And that's due to pivot irrigation. You have a pivot in the center of each one of these areas. You have an arm that extends out that carries water. This arm is on wheels and as as the minutes go by, the arm uh, rotates around its pivot to irrigate the land. So the corners, if you think about these as being squares, the corners don't get irrigated. So this the president of the irrigation company was asking the farmer what his schedule for pivot irrigation was. And this farmer said that he couldn't he wasn't legally allowed to turn the irrigation system on until some particular date in the spring. Once that date arrived, his policy was to turn the irrigation system on and not turn it off until the fall, except if it was raining so hard that he was worried that the wheels that support the pivot irrigation machinery might get stuck in the mud. So. I, I don't know, economists hesitate to use the word waste, but if you face zero marginal cost for something like water, then this is the optimal thing to do. Because as the farmer was explaining, with his rather old system, it took a lot of effort to turn the system off. You actually had to send somebody out in a truck in order to turn the thing off, and then later when you wanted to turn it back on, you had to send somebody uh, again to go out. Um, this this irrigation company was selling modern computerized tools so that the farmer could control the pivot irrigation system without actually having to go out and and uh, do it on site but that just gives you an idea of the difference between how utah water users use water and uh, utah urban water users use water and how utah farmers use water 
I remember one example, we had a, a drought here in Utah when Rocky Anderson was mayor of Salt Lake City, and he encouraged people when they went to a restaurant um, to tell the waiter not to bring them a glass of water unless they really wanted to drink the water. Uh, you know, th These kinds of efforts by urban dwellers to conserve water are almost literally a drop in a bucket compared to the water consumption of Utah farmers. And I'll make a comment, I don't want to talk about this a great deal, but I have done some research, and if you go to my website on the miscellaneous research um, part of the website, you can see some of the results of this research, on two proposed water projects in Utah. One is the Lake Powell Pipeline, and one is the Bear River Project. The Lake Powell Pipeline is a proposed pipeline in the very southern part of the state to tr transport water from Lake Powell, which is an artificial reservoir on the Colorado River, north and especially west to Washington County, which is where the city of St. George is located. And the Bear River Project is a project to put a series of, of dams on the Bear River, which is a river in northeastern Utah, and is the biggest supply of water to the Great Salt Lake. These are multi-billion dollar projects. It's not clear how many billions. Uh, the Lake Powell Pipeline, perhaps um, two or three billion. Uh, the Bear River Project, um, a little bit less than that. The details, as I said, I've done research on, but I didn't look them up for the purposes of this video. And the argument in favor of these is, th is to take care of population growth. But again, the vast majority of water that's used in Utah is used in agriculture. And so the real reason for these is to support continued agricultural use of water. Indeed, one of the things I've done is to calculate how much costly, costlier it is to build these water projects than it would be to simply pay farmers not to produce. And it would be much, much cheaper to pay farmers not to produce. Now, if you did that, you would hurt people who aren't farmers, who live in rural areas and depend on the farm economy for their livelihood. And so I think it'd be quite important to make sure that those people didn't get harmed when you, let's say, paid farmers not to farm and diverted that water to urban areas. And the state of California is thinking about, uh, well, has been slowly changing California water law in order to make it possible to have these transfers of water from agricultural areas to urban areas. The country of Australia is much more advanced in terms of the capabilities of Australian farmers to divert water that they don't want to use to urban areas and get paid for it. I think quite likely that's the future of water use in the West rather than continuing to supply water for crops like alfalfa which are a pretty low value it's a pretty low value use. In terms of the GNP that that generates, uh, the gross state product that that generates versus supplying water to uh, urban areas of the state. Now, so this is a, an example of government failure. Government uh, subsidizes water for agriculture but doesn't subsidize water as much for urban areas and so you have this difference in the price of water that generates inefficiencies. The next example is uh, developing countries' subsidies. The, the, bo the book has pretty extensive discussion of this. One example they give is fuel subsidies. Now on page uh, 88, box 6.3, you can see the data. It is pre-1989 data. As I mentioned in the first day of class, that's one of the disadvantages of our using an old textbook. It doesn't have modern data. But the fact of the matter is that countries all over the world still subsidize fuel. And this can cause balance of payments problems, which means that sometimes the countries are paying so much money for the fuel, f to, to import the fuel, and then they sell it at such a low price that it's a money loser for the government. And sometimes it loses so much money that the government really can't maintain the low price anymore. So it raises the retail price and that can cause protests, even violent riots. There are even some countries, uh, Iran is an example, which are oil exporters but have to import refined petroleum products like gasoline because they don't themselves possess enough refinery capacity. And so 
e even they can run into these balance of payments problems if they subsidize the retail price of gasoline. Venezuela, until a few years ago, um, I don't know when that was, perhaps 2018, uh, subsidized the price. And Venezuela is another uh, oil exporter that has to import gasoline because it doesn't have the refinery capacity itself to refine the petroleum that it produces. Uh, Venezuela had a huge subsidy on gasoline. So the gasoline was something like, and I don't remember the number, something like 25 cents a gallon. And this was generating gigantic balance of payments problems for the Venezuelan government. Finally, they had to abandon that, but it caused riots because people were really upset. All of a sudden, they had to pay much, much more money for, for gasoline. S uh, subsidies on fertilizer and food production are also pretty common in developing countries. One of the results of this is overproduction of food. So then you need to somehow get rid of it. Now in the U.S. as well, you have you have subsidies that generate overproduction of food. One of the reasons for, let's say, the school lunch program is so that the government can support, let's say, the production of cheese by buying cheese from farmers when otherwise the price of cheese would be too low and the farmers would get a low price for cheese. So the government buys the cheese and then the government uses the cheese in the school lunch program. So developing countries, you also have some subsidies on food production. Subsidies on fertilizer can clearly generate environmental problems. Any, any kind of subsidy on food production can generate environmental problems. Fertilizer here is an example. If you subsidize fertilizer and food production, then you give people incentive to grow more food. Why is that bad? Deforestation is one reason. If you have an incentive to grow more food than before, you may decide to cut down the forest in order to, to grow that food, e either crops or, or rangeland for cattle. And that, of course, is bad for global warming. Fertilizer subsidies in particular can cause water pollution. I remember reading in Mexico, there are large subsidies for fertilizer, and therefore the farmers use way more fertilizer than they need to, what happens then is that when it rains, the fertilizer runs off the fields and into uh, streams, lakes, and rivers, and that causes very serious degradation in their water quality. You get algal blooms, sometimes poisonous uh, algae, making the water poisonous, and, and so forth. So these are environmental problems that are caused by subsidies on fertilizer and food production. Um, subsidies on irrigation, of course we talked about subsidies on irrigation in the United States, but there are also subsidies on irrigation in developing countries that can result in water logging, increased salinity. Okay, so the increase in salinity comes because if you depend on rainfall, the rain that comes from the clouds doesn't have salt. But if you depend on irrigation water that comes from uh, water that has uh, th that has traveled over the ground or through the ground, when water travels over or through the ground, it picks up salt because the salt is contained in in the earth, in the in the dirt, in the ground. And so, when you when you put that on your crops, then you're going to increase the soil content of your crops. Some of you might remember from your uh, high school or junior high school days, learning about the so-called fertile crescent in ancient history. So the Fertile Crescent is the country that we now call Iraq. It was really fertile back in the in, in the old days, thousands of years ago. It's less fertile now because of many centuries of irrigation that have increased the salinity of the soil to the extent that in some areas you can't grow crops anymore. Dams, of course, are often associated with water projects and irrigation subsidies. I've written here, loss of ancestral, ancestral villages due to dams. One of the biggest dams, perhaps the, the biggest dam in the world, I'm not sure, is the Three Gorges Dam in China, which is a fairly new dam, uh, inundated a large amount of land where people had been living for many centuries, in fact, probably a few millennia. And so you had a large loss of archaeological uh, sites, uh, ar archaeological uh, resources due to due to that dam.
Okay, so these are some examples of government failures. We are going to, in the next video, going to spend a lot of time in a more technical discussion with graphs, analyzing one particular government failure, which is the government failure in the European Union on tariffs on imported food. So that's where we're going next.